Good morning, congregation. I'd like to welcome each one of you here as we may worship the Lord our God, and we also welcome our guests who are with us this morning, and also those who have joined in online. Many of us have had the privilege to listen to the Awake to Praise Choir in the last two days, and we can hear of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ in song, and we praise his name for it and for that glorious gospel. And may that word penetrate each one of our hearts that we may live in praise to his name. There's one announcement, the wedding bands, Natasha, Georgia Otten, and Brandon and Michael Meyer have indicated their intention to be desired, to be married before the face of God. They desire to begin this holy state in the name of the Lord and to complete it to his glory. The Lord willing, apart from any legal objections, the ceremony will take place April 15, 2023, here in Vineland. This is the first announcement. Our call to worship comes to us this morning from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, where we read, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's respond with singing from our psalm books from selection A16, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. A16, and we'll sing all verses.
The Lord our God has called us and brought us together to worship him. We confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, and in Christ Jesus is an overflowing fountain of good. Amen. Receive the greeting of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us praise God with singing from the well-known words of Psalm 84, Psalter number 227. 227, O Lord of hosts, how lovely thy tabernacles are. We'll sing all three stanzas. Let us hear together the law of God as we read it from Exodus 20 and the summary from Matthew chapter 22. And let us sing in response the words of Psalter number 364, all the stanzas, from out the depths I cry to thee, O let thy ear attentive be. 364. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. 
For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us read further in God's Word this morning now from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 15. Today is Palm Sunday, and I thought maybe to bring a Palm Sunday message, but wanting also to finish our study in Mark 15, decided to do that this morning. Mark 15, then we have, in these weeks leading up to Good Friday, worked our way through this entire chapter, highlighting the and then on Good Friday, Lord willing, a message to do with what it all mean and how it should affect us and transform us. But this morning then from Mark 15, verse 42, through the end of the chapter, and this is uh, the account of Jesus' burial, and these verses will be our text for this morning. So God's Word at Mark 15, verse 42. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock. 
and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. So, Father, reading of God's Word, let us now come to God in prayer and seek for His blessing as we worship Him. Great and glorious God, it's a beautiful day, and it is a day again that You have made. Will You help us to rejoice and be glad in it? We thank You that it is a Lord's Day and that we may be together, called by You and brought here into this place. So many of us, particularly to worship you. We praise you, Lord, for your grace and for your goodness. And it's a special Sunday also as we reflect on on it being Palm Sunday, on the day, on the Sunday that the Lord Jesus many years ago was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and doing so to the acclaim of the peoples as they waved their palm branches and laid out their coats on the path for Jesus' donkey to walk down and as they cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to our coming King. But a moment that was marked also by ignorance and blindness on the part of so many. They did not really know whom they praised. They did not understand why you had come, Lord Jesus. And still you persevered in your path appointed for you and you continued to go to the cross. You continued to serve as the man of sorrows, as the one who would stand in the place of all your people. Though we are by nature in the depths and when your spirit teaches us to know our sin, then we realize we are in the depths. Nevertheless, you, Lord Jesus, went into those depths on our behalf. We confess that we are not really able to understand the fullness of what you have done. We can read the gospel accounts. We can ponder the apostolic reflections. We can look back to the prophetic predictions. We can appreciate the comfort of the promises, but to understand what you, Lord Jesus, went through when you who knew no sin was made to be sin. We don't understand. We only marvel and stand in awe of your goodness, of your grace and love, of your steadfastness. And we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that even as we are here in the sanctuary this morning, we all may confess our sins to you and repent of our sins and receive forgiveness through your blood which was shed. Grant to us all that full atonement and to be reconciled to our God and to live in peace, to have peace with God and to confess that we are debtors to mercy alone and to praise you with all our heart and soul and to say, worthy is the Lamb that was slain, to receive honor and glory and blessing and power, and to offer ourselves to you, to offer our bodies to you a living sacrifice. Lord, grant to us that as we, as we commemorate the sufferings, death, resurrection of our Savior, we may do so in a way that we are, we are moved and we are affected and we are transformed. Help us all, we pray, young and old, and work in us all. We need that so much. We need your Spirit so much, and we pray for him in us today. We thank you for what we could enjoy, so many of us, the last number of days. Those who sang in the choir or played in the orchestra or conducted or accompanied, and those who listened, who came to the concerts, or maybe listened online or both. Lord, what a privilege that we can meet together in this way and praise you so jubilantly. And we thank you for beautiful music. And we thank you for an amazing gospel. And we thank you for the joy of our salvation and for the way we could be encouraged and lifted up. And we pray that your name may have been praised 
and that your work would have gone on also in the hearts of those who were present, some who maybe didn't know you yet, don't know you still. But we pray that the power of the Word of God, the truth of God, may be at work in their lives to save them. And also I to sanctify your people, to increase our faith, and to make us more steadfast in our service. We pray, Lord, for the choir as they rest, and we pray that you will bless them over the summer. Thank you for this ministry. Thank you also for word and deed and the ministry that we could support through the offerings. And we pray, Lord, for the work of word and deed in Turkey and in India and in Africa and in so many places in the world. We ask that you would bless the proclamation of the gospel and the care for people's bodies as well as their souls. Take care of your church, O Lord, in every place. Preserve her. Defend her and bless her. And do so also for us as a congregation. We come to you as a needy people. We come to you, Lord, as a people dependent on your grace every day. We thank you when you give us life and when you sustain our life also over a number of years. And we rejoice with Betty Jansen and Brenda Wasink and Patricia Mostert as they may celebrate birthdays later this week. We thank you for all you have given them and we pray for them, each one in their personal circumstances and with their families and with their loved ones, that they may also see your goodness and praise you for your grace and continue to serve you as you enable them to do. We also thank you for new life and especially for the birth of Zipporah given to David and Jennifer, that you have granted everything to go well. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless mother and child and that you will be with this family also as they have come to attend worship with us and become part of us. We pray for them, Lord, in this time of their life, that you may also uphold them and strengthen them, and that you may bless the little girl together with her brother, and that they may be raised in the fear of God, and that they may love you and serve you all the days of their life. We pray for those under doctor's care among us. We continue to lift up to you Rob Sinke as he awaits news on treatments. We pray for him and for healing for him by the means that will be appointed and utilized. We pray for strength for him and for his faith to remain strong. Bless his family as they encourage him and support him. We also pray for Dr. Hans Terlau, still in the hospital. Be with him, Lord, and remember him in his weakness, in body and also in mind and heart. We pray for him that you will uphold him that you will fortify him with the truths of your word which he has long, long known, and that by the power of your spirit he may continue to rest in you. Be near to him, O Lord. And remember his wife and his family, and bless them and strengthen them as they stand by, and as they support him, as they seek to encourage him. Lord, we pray for others too in special need. You know all of the congregation. You know those who are mourning. You know those, Lord, who are lonely. You know those who are hurting in family life and marriage. You know those who are agonizing for their children, for their conversion, for their return. Lord, we pray that you will uphold and help each one. Remember, too, in this world in which we live, in which there is so much sorrow. We think of even here in Niagara, where there has been the death of a young boy on the highway just a few days ago, not far from here. A family local to us and we pray Lord for that grieving family we do not know them but we pray for them and we pray that you may remember them in mercy we think too of how this world has been shook again this past week by numerous deaths whether through shootings or tornadoes or crashes and wars and famines and diseases continue and we live in a broken and groaning creation O Lord that cries out for redemption we pray that you will have mercy we pray that you will continue to bless to that end the proclamation of the gospel. And everywhere your word goes out today, make it mighty, make it to be heard, make it to be so fruitful, even to bear a hundredfold, O Lord, for the glory of Christ, the Redeemer, who suffered, died, and rose again. We pray, therefore, that you will bless us now and be with us now and help us as we worship you. Indeed, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord now with our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings for the work of safe families. May the Lord bless you and your gifts. 
Afterwards, we'll sing from Psalm 23, Psalter number 55. Psalter number 55, the precious words of the Lord as our shepherd, Psalm 23. We'll sing all three stanzas.
Well, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's been a few weeks since we were in Mark 15. So just to help your memory, over the course of these last number of, of weeks leading up to Good Friday and Easter, we've been thinking about Jesus accused, as Mark describes that. Jesus accused, Jesus condemned, Jesus crucified, Jesus dying. Mark has highlighted all of those moments in Jesus' experience. And now today, with our text before us, we may hear about Jesus buried. In other words, his body sealed up in a tomb. We shouldn't overlook this. It's an important part of Jesus' redemptive work. It's an important detail in his humiliation. Indeed, every Lord's Day when we confess the Apostles' Creed, we include this point. He was crucified, dead, and buried. It's because as he came into this world to save his people, he came under the curse of the law. And so this burial had to be part of that. Even as the Lord signified something of that to Adam long ago, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Jesus didn't return to dust, of course, but that was symbolically represented in his being tucked away in the depths of the earth. And just think of that now for a moment. You've, many of us, we've been to the cemetery. We've had to lay to rest the remains of loved ones, some of you numerous times. It's never easy. It's, it's painful. It's sobering. But what our text is telling us is that this happened also to Jesus, that his body was brought, as it were, to the cemetery. His body was laid to rest in the earth. What a profound and mysterious thing it is to say, isn't it, that Jesus, the God-man, the incarnate Son of God, was buried. What can we learn from this? Why do all the Gospels make a point of this, giving to us also some details with regard to the way it happened? Well, let's, with God's help, seek to understand as much as we can and study it this morning by way of the text in Mark. Jesus buried is our theme, and we'll notice two things. First, how that goes, and second, why that matters. Jesus buried, how that goes. And we simply want to work our way through this passage. Verse 42 tells about how the evening had come. That has to mean early evening or what to us is often referred to as late afternoon, sometime after three or so when Jesus died, and before six when the Sabbath officially began and every faithful Jew sought to be home and resting. And Luke's account, by the way, says that they did that in this case, particularly the women that were watching. They rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And so that means that the time frame for our text must be some where between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock, let's realize that there was pressure to get Jesus buried. One of the reasons was that the Sabbath was coming, and it seems they didn't bury on the Sabbath. Even today, apparently, that's true. Jews won't bury on the Sabbath. So they had to get Jesus buried in a hurry before Sabbath came, and, and a further concern was that because he had been crucified and his body was hanging on a tree, the Lord spoke in the law in Deuteronomy about how bodies on the trees could not remain overnight. You can read that in Deuteronomy 21. And so there was a lot of pressure to get Jesus buried in a hurry. But whoever would do it, whoever would do it. Not the Romans, they, they didn't care. They often left the bodies on the cross for days. They wouldn't bury Jesus. Well, maybe then the disciples, they could but of course, none of them were around, with maybe the exception of John. He had been at the cross, at least for a time. Perhaps he was no longer present, having taken Mary, Jesus' mother, home. What about the women who were at the cross? Could, could they have done it? Probably not. It wouldn't have been easy to get permission, and even with permission, it wouldn't have been easy to get Jesus' body off the cross. No, the women, they couldn't have done it. Who then will do it? It's at this point that we read about this man named Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea was a town somewhat north of Jerusalem. 
In the Old Testament, it was known as the city of Ramah. Maybe you remember Ramah as the hometown of Samuel. Joseph was from there. And about Joseph, we read some important things. Number one, he was a prominent council member. That means he was a ruler in Israel. He was part of the Sanhedrin, in fact. He was one of the 70 men who were responsible to lead the Jewish people. It was a Sanhedrin council that had met to decide Jesus' fate, as we can read at the beginning of Mark 15. Joseph was part of that council. And so immediately we might be rather concerned about mention of Joseph. Also because we're told he was a prominent council member. He wasn't a backbencher. He wasn't a junior member. No, he was one of the leaders. He was someone everyone looked up to. How can it be good to read about him now? Does the council have more in mind for Jesus? Will they express more hatred and evil towards him? We might fear to read about Joseph. But as it turns out, Joseph is different than might be expected. Mark says that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. That's a remarkable phrase, isn't it? How good if that's said about us, that we are waiting for the kingdom of God. What it means about Joseph is that he was not simply a politician, nor even a religious politician. Rather, we have every reason to believe he was a truly spiritual man. In other words, he was a man who had learned in his life to acknowledge God and to depend on God and to see something also of the plan and work of God in the world. And Joseph was aware also of the promises of God including his promise to usher in his kingdom, his rule and reign throughout all of creation. Somehow, Joseph understood these things to a degree at least. And likewise, Joseph had become sensitive and tender. And Joseph's heart beat with longing for God's kingdom to come, for God himself to appear, as it were, as it were for God to work, for God to make his mighty power and grace known. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was a man who was not living for himself. He was a man who was not in love with power or this world. But he was learning to look beyond all that he could see to the God who is on high and would promise the kingdom. And Joseph was trusting in this God. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. Again, how good when that can be said about us. When we are already members of the kingdom, of course, as it has come in Jesus, and when we are waiting for the fullness of that kingdom to arrive when he returns. Mentioning Jesus, though, we can say more of, of Joseph because John, in his gospel, John chapter 20, verse 38, tells us that Joseph had become a disciple of Jesus. So he wasn't just waiting for the kingdom of God. He was a disciple of Jesus. That means that he had come to believe in Jesus and believe that Jesus was truly God's man and the means by whom God would bring in his kingdom. Joseph believed that. We may even say that Joseph had come to see his need for Jesus and begun to believe in Jesus and to follow Jesus. But John also tells us something else about Joseph. John tells us that Joseph did this secretly. At least up till this point, he was a secret disciple. So that means he kept his views and his feelings and his heart more or less to himself. He was not yet a public disciple. How many Christians today understand this? Also among us. How many of us have had times or moments when we kept our faith secret, or, or when we were at least tempted to do so. For whatever reason, maybe afraid, maybe embarrassed. We didn't want to be laughed at. We didn't want to be rejected by our friends or family or people at work. Maybe in the restaurant when our food comes, you know, better just to pray in our head. No closing our eyes, no bowing our head, no folding our hands, just, just in our head. That's good enough. Or maybe at work a conversation is happening and it's about issues of the day and you know the Christian position is pretty narrow, pretty unacceptable and you're just hoping no one will ask you what you think. 
And if they ask you, you sort of hedge and hem and haw. And we know what that's like, don't we? At least that temptation. Or maybe to be invited somewhere and we shouldn't go because it's no place to go. No place for a believer. Maybe to see a, an ungodly movie or to attend a, a wild party. There are things believers shouldn't see. There are places believers shouldn't go, but maybe we're invited and we don't dare to say no. And So we go along and we watch, or we go along and we drink way too much. We participate in some otherworldly activity or idolatry or depravity. We, we joined in because we weren't courageous. And at best in that moment, what are we? Secret disciples, at best. And the point is we understand Joseph. We don't look down on Joseph. He was a secret disciple. We have been secret disciples at times too. And so Joseph, however he lived out his secret faith and whatever compromises he made, we don't know. But yes, he was waiting for the kingdom of God and he was a disciple of Jesus, but he was secret. Nobody knew. Let us realize that true disciples cannot remain secret forever. The Lord will not allow that. When we are truly his, then his spirit lives in us, and eventually he will force the issue. He will compel us to confess. All true believers will. The Lord will make sure of that. And so also with Joseph. And our text tells about that, how Joseph took courage and went to Pilate. In fact, Joseph's courage began even before this. We learn from Luke's account, when he describes all this, Luke says Joseph was a good and just man who had not consented to the council's decision. That's interesting, isn't it? Luke writes that in Luke 23, 50 and 51. The Sanhedrin council, they met, and they voted to take Jesus to Pilate. And they planned their approach, and they planned their accusations. Jesus will die. They decide that. It's a council decision, but it was not a unanimous decision. However that went, we don't know whether Joseph stayed home in silence, didn't attend the session, or was he present but simply didn't vote? We don't know any of that, but however he did it, he refused to approve the decision and the deed of the council. Even for him, while he was a secret disciple, there was a line that he would not, that he could not cross. And let's realize that that took some courage. It's like when you say, I'm, I'm not going to that party. I'm not hanging out with those people. I'm not watching that movie. I'm not doing it. And a line forms in your mind and, a, and in your heart, and you don't cross that line. That's the start of courage. And that was Joseph. And then our text describes even more when it says that he came and took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Why did that take courage? Well, one reason is that it meant he was breaking with his colleagues on the council. In the past, he was passively courageous with his refusal to approve their condemnation of Jesus. You know, raise your hands if you agree that Jesus should die and take him to Pilate. Say I, but Joseph didn't raise his hand. He didn't say I. He was passive, and that was courageous, but now he has to be active, and that is even more courageous on his part. He has to step up and come forward and be public. And courage that takes going to Pilate, seeking an audience with Pilate, making his request to Pilate, and his colleagues inevitably finding out, what are you doing, Joseph? What are you doing? And just like that, the secret was no longer a secret. And Joseph was letting them know where he stood and on whose side he served and to whom his heart belonged. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning no turning back. No matter what the Sanhedrin might say or do. And don't forget also the risk in terms of Pilate, because Pilate was quite unpredictable. Would he give Joseph permission, or would he say, Joseph, you're one of those? Come with me. We'll put you in prison. No one could predict Pilate's response, but Joseph went to him nonetheless, made his request to him, and the point is that that took courage. He must have thought, I'll risk it. Serving Jesus is worth it. Whatever happens, it's worth it. Can we not learn from Joseph? Can we not be challenged by Joseph? 
Do we seek to be courageous Christians? Of course, we first need to be Christian. That's true. We need, like Joseph, to be waiting for the kingdom of God and belonging to it by faith and living in accord with it, not serving ourselves but, and not joining in sin, but living separately, obediently, faithfully as children of the kingdom and waiting for the fullness of the kingdom. Indeed, when the king himself will appear on the clouds, is that you and me? Is that you and me? Is that the way we are living? If not yet, come and belong to the kingdom. Come and be true servants of the king. Come and join in waiting for the kingdom. Anyone is welcome. Everyone may join. The only condition is that we swear allegiance to the king. Turn from sin and trust in him. Again, the call goes out. But then let's also be like Joseph here and seek to be courageous for the king. Courageous in faith, courageous in obedience, courageous in our witness and testimony. And we need to pray for courage. Not to be a secret disciple, but let it be known, let it be public. We're with Jesus. We belong to him. But back to the text, Joseph is before Pilate now, and he asked for the body of Jesus. And we read that Pilate marveled. Verse 44, Pilate marveled that Jesus was already dead. That means he says something like, he's dead already? How can that be? Now, why did Pilate say that? Why did he marvel? Well, it's because the crucified often took many hours and even days to die. Hours and even days. We have records of crucified people on the cross for three, four days before they died. That was part of the agony and the torture of, of that kind of execution. The crucified hung, dying for a long time. And so a mere six or seven hours after Pilate had sent Jesus to the cross, now to hear that Jesus is dead? It's a surprise. Maybe, too, it was painful for Pilate's conscience. We, we, we can be sure he did not enjoy the trial of Jesus. He was well aware of the innocence of Jesus. And he had to have known deep inside that he was dealing unjustly with Jesus. And for all kinds of reasons, then, Pilate could hardly have been doing well on this Friday. It could not have been a good day for him. And now suddenly, Joseph is standing before him requesting the body of Jesus, and that can only mean Jesus is dead. He's dead. Is he really dead? And we read that Pilate summons the centurion, who had overseen the crucifixion to come and confirm it. And by the way, that's not unimportant because the centurion reports that, yes, Jesus is dead, and we can be sure centurions would know. They had no reason to lie. They were expert executioners. And so by all accounts, Jesus is dead. We'll come back to that. But now with Pilate's permission, Joseph can go back to the cross. And another detail to keep in mind is that by this point, he's no longer alone, but he has a helper, an assistant. John, the gospel writer, tells us about Nicodemus joining him. Nicodemus was a fellow council member, and he too had been a secret disciple. But now, like Joseph, he also takes courage. And so Nicodemus is able to help Joseph. But the main emphasis falls on Joseph. He takes the initiative. What's more, he has the necessary resources. Matthew, Matthew tells us that Joseph was a rich man. And so he brought all the wrappings, the fine linens. And Nicodemus came with spices. And together they must have worked somehow to take Jesus' body off the cross. And ever so respectfully then, they wrap Jesus' body with the linens. And into the linens and in the wrappings, they pour all the spices. This was, this was meant to help offset the smells of death. And so Jesus is wrapped up, and then, then we read about how he's laid in a tomb. A tomb which has been hewn out of the rock, not far away from where the cross, the cross stood. And very likely it was a rich man's tomb, because just think of the time and expense required to carve out that tomb. How many hundreds of man hours must have been invested into that tomb? It's commonly thought that this was Joseph's own tomb, that he had carved it for himself, just like today when people buy plots. 
in preparation for their burial. So in Bible times, people, and especially people with means, Joseph was rich. He was able to purchase and prepare a very fine tomb. Matthew says it was a new tomb. Luke reports that it had never been used before. Those details matter, too, on the day of resurrection. And what's also fulfilled in this moment are the words of Isaiah, long before, all about how Jesus' grave is with the rich. Isaiah 53, he's buried in a rich man's tomb. He may have died as if he were a criminal, crucified, yes, but now in his burial he's honored as a rich man. A new tomb in the rocks. No man's body ever laid there before. And Jesus' body is laid there because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And then we read a stone is rolled against the door of the tomb. This was common enough. Safety and security. No animals could get in. No people either. At least not very easily. The stone is rolled into place. And then the last thing we read in the text is that while Joseph was at work, he was not alone for two women at least were present and watching. Mary Magdalene, verse 47, and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where Jesus was laid. We should have to admire these women, don't we? Their devotion, their bravery. Almost everyone else had forsaken Jesus. These women stayed with him to the very end. They deserve our respect. Let us be challenged by them. Oh, Jesus, let us say, we have promised to serve thee to the end. But with that, the text comes to an end, and the burial is finished, at least for now. The next chapter will tell about women returning on Sunday to the tomb to anoint Jesus. There must have been some sense that they felt the burial was incomplete, that the work was incomplete, that more honor was due to the body, that more anointing should happen. But that will have to wait. For now, the Sabbath is coming and everyone has to go home. And Jesus' lifeless body rests quietly in the grave. He's buried. And now we have to ask the question, why, why all this about, about this? Why, why do all these gospel writers tell us Make a point of it. Give so many details to help us believe he's buried. Well, that's our second point, why it matters. Why it matters that Jesus is buried. And why it matters is this. It tells us, it confirms to us, he's dead. We don't bury a living man. Only the dead get buried. And so Jesus buried must mean he's truly dead. Now you might say that's so obvious. Again, I, what's the point of it? But remember how our catechism makes this same point. Maybe our students in grade 9 and 10 remember because just a few weeks ago you memorized this. The catechism says at one point, why was he also buried? And the answer is simple, very simple, thereby to prove that he was really dead. So he was crucified, he's dead, and he's buried, and his burial underscores that he's died. Again, you may be wondering, you may be thinking, I still don't see why that's so significant. So let, let, let me try to help us with two reasons at least this morning. As we reflect on this moment in Jesus' experience, two reasons why it matters that he was buried confirming that he was dead. One reason is this. Through learning that he's buried and therefore truly dead, we learn, we are confirmed that he truly did what he came to do. What did he come to do? Well, he came to save sinners. He came to redeem his people. He came to deliver us from sin, death, and hell. And he came to do it by giving his life a ransom for many. Let's never forget that. It's not his coming that saved us. It's not his ministry that saves us. It's not his example that saves us. 
It's not even his suffering that saves us, though that's part of it. No, he had to die to save us. Everything else matters, of course. It's important. It's part of the lead-up to it. But he had to die in order to be the Savior. If he didn't die, he would be of no help to us, and we'd have no salvation. Jesus had to die. That's because sinners deserve to die. And left to ourselves, sinners, we sinners will die. Paul puts it very plainly in, in, in Romans, Romans chapter 6. The wages of sin is death. Are you a sinner? Have you sinned? Here's your payout. Death. And so Hebrews 9 says unequivocally, it is, it is appointed unto man once to die. It is appointed for you, for me, to die. And to die in payment for our sin. To die as a judgment for our sin. And so if Jesus Christ, God's Son, beloved from all eternity, come into this world, is going to take our place, is going to pay for our sin, is going to deliver us from what we deserve, then He must die. How the Lord makes this point over and over again in the Scriptures. Think of the sacrifices in the tabernacle, and later in the temple, and all the goats and lambs and bulls and doves and everything else that was brought in there. It wasn't just presented to God, here's a nice animal. No, was killed. Had to be slain. And also in the Passover, when God's angel of death came into Egypt, and every household had a lamb, it wasn't good enough if that lamb was playing in the corner of the house. When the angel of death came over, the lamb had to have been killed, and its blood had to have been applied to the doorpost. Otherwise, there'd be no protection, and the firstborn would die. And so the message is driven home throughout the Bible. If Jesus will be the Savior of his people, when he comes, he must die. And so if we'd not be sure if Jesus died, if, if there'd ever be some questions about that, how shaky that would make the Christian faith, and how doubtful and uncertain every Christian would be. Imagine the devil getting a hold of this. Imagine if the devil, if there'd be no confirmation as such that Jesus had actually died, if, if the devil could get a hold of that and say, you know, you, you needed a Jesus who died for you. How do you know he died? No one really knows he died. You're not likely saved. At least you can never be sure you have been saved if you don't know that he has died. But see, we, we can know that he has died. We can be sure. Because he was buried. Yes, Jesus truly died. The law required it. The Old Testament foreshadowed it. Jesus himself predicted it. The gospel writers record it. And his burial confirms it. Everyone leaves his body there, tucked in the grave. He's dead. And by the way, this should so comfort us and encourage us. Whenever we are convicted of sin and we know something of what we deserve and how often that can happen in our life. Every day we sin, sometimes so grievously and repeatedly, so inexcusably. We sin and what do we do? And how can we be sure that God will forgive us? And we have to go to Him and we must trust in His Son and we must pray for forgiveness. And because we know that He died, because there can be no doubt about that, Confirmed through the burial, we can be sure also that God will forgive our sin. The price has been paid. Jesus, he didn't just come. He didn't just serve. He didn't just suffer. He died. Look, the gospel writers say, he was buried. And again, let that comfort us and encourage us to go to Jesus and to seek his mercy and grace, how we need his mercy and grace every day, and to ask him to forgive every sin, and then to be sure that he will. We may pray in confidence. We may be fully assured. He is so eager and willing to wash us from every sin to the blood that was shed because it was shed, because he died. He was buried. And so Jesus' burial means that he really died. That's why it matters that he was buried. But there's more to say, and with this we'll finish. Just think how Jesus' burial... And all the details, as told by Mark and the others, helps to confirm our faith in the resurrection. 
in the resurrection. Because when Jesus appears again on the Sunday after his death, when, when people see him and they encounter him, Mary Magdalene and some other women, and Peter and the travelers to Emmaus, and in the evening the ten disciples in the upper room, they all see him. He shows himself to them. When that happens, that is the, the only plausible or really the only possible explanation is that he is risen, that he rose. There is no other way to explain his appearing. He must have risen. He must be alive. He must be the victor over sin, death, and hell because he was dead. And we know that because he was buried. And for three days his body was in the grave in the tomb. He was dead. No doubt about that. Joseph put him there. Pilate permitted it to happen. Two women saw the place. And it was a new tomb, and there was no other corpse in the tomb. And so on Sunday morning, when the tomb is empty, and meanwhile Jesus is out, is, is out and about meeting people and greeting people, and it's him, it's really him, the only thing, the only way that can be is that he truly rose. And we see how that's meant to help our faith. Again, imagine if he hadn't been buried. Imagine if he had just been left on the cross Friday Saturday. And then on Sunday morning, he came down from the cross, or maybe in the night or something. Pe people would say, you know, we can explain that. He, he didn't die. He, he just fainted. He was just unconscious for some time. And maybe during the night, someone came there and they, they kind of revived him a little bit. They gave him some medicine or some food or some water. And maybe on Saturday night, some disciples came with a ladder and they they took him off the cross and they revived him and they, he just rested for a while. And now he's out, he, he's out and, and, and it's, it's not a resurrection. Resurrections can't happen. But we say that's all impossible. He, he was buried. He was, he was dead. And then he rose. And so we see that it matters that he was buried. It's not an unimportant detail. It's a profound detail. It's a mysterious detail. It's a crucial detail. It means he was dead. He paid for our sins, all who believe in him. He paid in full for all our sins. And then he rose to live and reign over all his people forever and ever. We can be sure. Are you sure? The Gospels mean to make us sure. And not just in an intellectual way, but in a in, in a life-transforming way so that we trust this Savior and we love Him and we serve Him with unbounded zeal and courage and doing so all the days of our life. And no matter what it might cost us, and even when we finally die, however we die, whenever we die, as we will, unless Jesus returns before then, otherwise we will die and we will be buried, most likely. Probably none of us likes to think about that. None of us looks forward to that. Put in a box, put in the ground. No thank you. Though we'll be dead, so we won't know. But doesn't it help us to remember what's happening then? What Jesus went through and what all his people go through. When we die, when we belong to the Lord... When we die, our souls go immediately to Christ. And yes, meanwhile, our lifeless bodies go to the grave. But because he too was buried, Jesus, let that comfort us in view of that thought. Because he was buried, he has gone before us. He has been in the grave. And so it will be okay. He has been there in our place. He has made it no longer a place of judgment, a place to rest in anticipation of the coming of the kingdom. And what is more? While well, he has been in the grave, he is no longer in the grave. Instead, he rose up from the grave, and even now in body and soul, he is alive forevermore, and someday he will take all his people to himself. What is the great Christian hope? We, we follow Christ through life and we follow Christ into the grave. And then we follow Christ out of the grave and with body and soul into everlasting life. This is the sure hope of the Christian. 
And how great, therefore, how wonderful to be a Christian. Yes. And how amazing, how amazing is Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, we have, by way of your word, walked along, as it were, as Jesus' body was taken from the cross and wrapped in linens and infused with spices, the linens, and then laid the body, laid in a tomb. And Joseph of Arimathea was in charge. And it's so interesting to read all about him. In so many ways, we are not like him. We are not prominent council members, but in so many ways, we understand him. We know the temptation to be secret disciples. And we also are challenged by his coming and taking courage. We thank you, Lord, for raising him up and for the care and respect with which he treated the body of your beloved son. We thank you for the way you made sure that it was buried and that it was a new tomb and no other body was there and the women were watching and all those details matter. And so we may be sure that Jesus died and we may be sure that the price has been paid. And we may be sure that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all our sin. And may we therefore all trust in this Christ and seek his pardon. And also we may be sure that he has risen from the dead and is alive forevermore. And so, Lord Jesus, help us, all of us, to trust you and love you and serve you publicly and faithfully and courageously and all the days of our life. And then when we die, not to be afraid. Maybe some are afraid of their bodies being put in the ground. It can be that's a fear. Lord, take that fear away by virtue of the fact that Christ's body was laid in the ground. And knowing, too, that someday our bodies will be resurrected and join with our souls and be in glory, perfected and glorified forever and ever. How great is our Christian hope and we pray, therefore, that you will bless this word and that we may praise you, our triune God, our Savior God, that we may praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, and that you will bless us further in this day and in the lead-up also to Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday next week. Go with us now, Lord, as we leave from here. Bless the Sunday school children as they meet and as they practice also for a little program next week. We pray that you will bless our fellowship. Keep us on this day of rest throughout the whole day, close to you, resting in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalter number 29 is our closing number. 29, all the stanzas in our doxology, 315.
receive the blessing of the Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.